this is the debtor's door from Newgate Prison in London. Just before 8.30 on the morning of the 1st of May, 1820, five men, Arthur Thistlewood, William Davidson, James Ings, Richard Tidd and John Brunt gathered at this door. They were waiting to take their last walk to the gallows and to a traitor's death. The men were parliamentary reformers, would be revolutionaries, advocates for universal male suffrage at a time when only 4% of the British population could vote. A crowd of thousands awaited them. Fearing rescue attempts, the government had posted troops around the prison. This fearsome looking axe had been specially commissioned for the occasion, but it was a stage prop. Laid in front of the platform, it symbolized the state's readiness to cut down the tree of liberty wherever it took root. The men were hanged, and after they were dead, beheaded by a masked man wielding a surgeon's knife. Their heads were held aloft and their names proclaimed as traitors. Thistlewood, Davidson and the rest had been convicted of treason for their part in the Cato Street Conspiracy of 1820. The years that followed the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 were a time of acute economic distress. Riots were commonplace, but in government the real fear was of radical reformers taking advantage of this widespread discontent to further their political objectives. In August 1819, cavalry were sent in against a peaceful meeting of reformers in St. Peter's Field, Manchester. The Peterloo Massacre left 18 dead and many more seriously injured. Arrests and a ban on public meetings followed. A clandestine world of secret societies and conspiracies remained. But the Home Secretary, Lord Sidmouth, controlled a network of spies that had thoroughly infiltrated this world. These spies often acted as agents provocateurs, urging the radicals onto violent acts so that they could be caught and punished. George Edwards was one such. By December 1819, he had wormed his way into a small group called the Spencian Society of Philanthropists, led by Arthur Thistlewood. Edwards made detailed reports to his superiors. The Spencians, he said, had been stockpiling weapons, guns, grenades, and these pike heads, which were used as evidence at their trial. Their plan was to assassinate the cabinet at one of their regular dinners, but these had not been held for some time. The group's money was running out and its members growing increasingly fractious. Then, on the 22nd of February, 1820, Edwards showed them a notice in an obscure newspaper. The cabinet were to dine at a minister's house the very next evening. This was an opportunity that could not be missed. Thistlewood ordered the group into action. They were to burst in on the cabinet, remind them of Peterloo, and with a cry of citizens, do your duty, murder them all. Coordinated fires and riots would follow. The people of Scotland and the North would rise up and Britain would become a republic. But the dinner was a lie. The government had placed the notice in the paper to flush the Spencians out. On the evening of the 23rd of February, the conspirators gathered in the dismal rooms on Cato Street off the Edgware Road. Little did they know that a warrant for their arrest had already been issued and the Bow Street runners were on their way. But despite holding all the cards, the runners bungled the arrests. A party of soldiers who were meant to accompany them got lost. The runners managed to capture William Davidson, the mixed race son of a Jamaican slave owner who was standing guard. But when they went upstairs to apprehend the rest of the group, Thistlewood drew his sword and killed one of the runners, Richard Smithers. The group scattered. They were rounded up during the following days and 13 of them were charged with treason. Their trial began on the 15th of April, 1820. The prosecution's case relied on Edward's evidence and the testimony of those conspirators who had turned Crown's witness to save their own necks. The defense argued that, as they had conspired to murder ministers, the men had not committed treason. But it did no good. 10 were sentenced to death, although five had their sentence commuted and were transported to Australia. Given the opportunity to plead for his life, Thistlewood was unrepentant. Albion is still in the chains of slavery. I quit it without regret. I shall soon be consigned to the grave. My body will be immured beneath the soil whereon I first drew breath. My motives, I doubt not, will hereafter be justly appreciated. So I will therefore now conclude by stating that I shall consider myself as murdered. The men spent only a few short days in Newgate Prison, where they remained principled and defiant. They refused the ministrations of the prison's Anglican chaplain and the supposed solace of his condemned sermon. 
James Ings even joked that he wished that his body might be conveyed to the king and that his majesty or his cooks might make turtle soup of it. But there was no laughter when their families visited to pay their farewells. Once the men's heads were off, they were put in coffins with their bodies. Quicklime was poured over them to speed up the process of decomposition and ensure that no relics would remain to encourage the idea of the men's martyrdom. They were buried beneath the passage to the Newgate cells. Hoping against hope, the families they left behind petitioned the king, which included this plea from Fissigwa's widow, Susan. She most humbly implores your majesty to be graciously pleased to grant that the now cold and mangled remains of her dear departed husband, which the law has placed at your majesty's disposal, may be delivered to her in order that she may have the consolation of performing towards them the last mournful duties. But the king did not deign to reply. The families of the Cato Street conspirators were left with nothing but their grief. 